most of us, um, when we think of a spouse cheating, even when we suspect that our spouse is cheating, we kind of have this idea, of just like this, this, this feeling that comes into us. It's like um, it's like an intense, uh, not hatred necessarily, but just like this jealousy and this this angst and this anger. And uh, we understand the concept of, of of being cheated on and 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 the pain involved with that. Um, and when we read. When we read Jeremiah, we see God comparing what Israel is doing to that kind of intimate betrayal. And before we get going into, into this part of this prophecy, I just want to take a minute and just, just think what that would be like. And don't, don't answer anything, but just think in your head what you would do if you, if you caught your spouse cheating. Just think about the pain that you're feeling and, 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 and what you think you would do from there. And with that in mind, I think we can go to Jeremiah, um, these prophecies in Jeremiah, with a little bit of a clearer head. Jeremiah 3, 11 through 13. And this starts the third prophecy that we've been looking at, or that we are looking at. And uh, it's around the same time, 620s. King, it's still under King Josiah. Um, that's the same king who's doing the, in the this religious reforms and fixing the temple and found the law and all that. Um the, the northern nation of Israel is already destroyed. Remember, it's just, the, just Judah that's left, just the southern nation. But uh, he's going call to call the exiles back in this prophecy. Kind of an important point there. So, the Lord announced to me, unfaithful Israel uh, has shown herself more righteous than treacherous Judah. And we looked at that. That's how we closed off last week. Go proclaim these words to the north and say, return, unfaithful Israel. This is the Lord's declaration. So when he says proclaim to the north, there's a source, uh, I believe it's the Talmud, that claims that Jeremiah literally went to the north and prophesied to them there in the scattered peoples and then came back to Judah. And there is some historical warrant for that because if you read like in, um, I want to say it's in the, in the book of Kings, um, the king Josiah doesn't go to Jeremiah for counsel. He goes to a different prophet. And that would explain it if he actually wasn't there he was on a trip to the north but the jeremiah actually never claims that he did it's just that's something that the talmud claims so he might have just faced the north a lot of times when the prophets the prophets wouldn't actually go they would face the direction i will i will not look on you with anger for i am unfailing in my love now uh, the idea here is very interesting if they simply turn from their sin god would forgive them that easy um and it's important to notice that God does get angry, but he doesn't stay angry. And when he gets angry, he doesn't change. Like when we get ang and when we get angry, like uh, people are known for becoming overcome with rage. Um, a good example of this is a husband who is typically calm and collected, you know, catching his, his spouse cheating and goes crazy and just kills somebody. You know, things that, I mean, like I told you that story uh, once of, of the state cop who who's renting from my dad and you know his girlfriend was was cheating on him i mean this is somebody who upholds the law and i mean he killed them both <laughs> so this is kind of kind of a good example of, of that how we kind of change in our anger but god doesn't change in his anger he, he stays the same his anger isn't petty like like you know how when we pout sometimes god doesn't god doesn't do that when he's angry and uh when we are angry we sin when god is angry he still acts justly like punishing the guilty, that's still a just thing for him to do. It's not like he sins by bringing justice. But that's not exactly how it works with us. We oftentimes can't separate the emotion of anger with the action. We oftentimes, you know, have these, if I'm angry, that means I can, you know. And I think that's why it's important, like what Ephesians says, to uh, be angry but do not sin. Well, God doesn't have that temptation um, he does get angry, but he do it doesn't lead him into sin. <clears throat> this is the Lord's declaration, I will not be angry forever. Now, th if you'll remember, in the last prophecy, they asked, Oh God, well, are you going to be for angry for forever? And so this is a actually a reference to, to that insincere prayer that Judah prayed, because they were like, Oh God, I'm not going to change what I'm doing, but are you still going to be angry for forever? 
And so they weren't actually repenting, they were giving off the pretense of repenting. And uh, so here he's actually using their exact wording back to say, yes, I will not be angry forever, O Israel, talking to the north instead of to the south. Only acknowledge your, um, only acknowledge your guilt. You have rebelled against the Lord your God. You have scattered your favors to strangers under every green tree and have not obeyed me. This is the Lord's declaration. So it says there, acknowledge your guilt. There can be no forgiveness without repentance. This is true for people. We can't just give people more chances if there's no, you know, turning from the thing. You know, you don't just keep giving your kids chance and chance and chance to have unrestricted internet access when they're obviously not trustworthy for that. And uh, it's the same with with God too. Um, he expects people to um, to repent, and with the church even, he, he, he instructs the church's leaders not to, you know, restore people back into the church if there isn't uh, repentance. So if a guy cheats, the, the, the wife shouldn't and won't, obviously, just simply accept him back. He can only be restored in his relationship with his wife or his girlfriend or whatever um, if he stops cheating. And if checks are put in place, like she's just not going to just accept him back, and she shouldn't just accept him back. Um, confessing sin is important to God because you acknowledge the wrong and you're asking for forgiveness. When God says that we should confess, this is very important because God won't bring us, God won't, we can't come to a point of asking God for forgiveness if we're not actually willing to admit that we've done something wrong. And confessing admits our weakness, it admits, admits our failures, and it, it admits our, our need for uh, God to God to heal and forgive us. Excuse me. So that brings up a very interesting question that is oftentimes asked, because it seems like the Bible says yes and no. And that's, is God's anger forever? So it sounds like it says that God's anger is forever and that it isn't for forever. And I want to look at those books, or those, those passages specifically. Now, there is a reference in what's called the Book of Judith, which is uh, not a biblical book. It is a it is a Jewish book, but it's not a biblical book. Um, and in that book, it says that God will not get angry, that God doesn't get angry. But this is the only reference that talks about God not getting angry. The Bible repeatedly says that God does, in fact, get angry. And I, I don't understand why whoever wrote Judith would claim that. So... Uh, that's just one of the many reasons why the book of Judith isn't in the Bible. Uh, it, it's not a biblical book, so it really doesn't matter what's in there. But So let's look at this, okay? These three passages are all from Malachi, I believe chapter 1, verse 4. And it says, in the ESV, it says, The people with whom the Lord is angry forever. And then in the NESB, it reads, The people with whom the Lord is indignant forever. And then the uh, CSB, it says, The people the Lord has cursed forever. And obviously you can see a, a wide range of possibility there. One is anger, like we think of anger like, ah, I'm mad. The other one is more indignant, like um, um, if I'm indignant towards Eli, um, I'm going to do things that are more, um, I'm going to change how our relationship is, you know what I mean? It's going to affect more of the action there. And if I have cursed Eli, well, then... Even if we're back on good terms, there is a curse there, right? So they all three have similar but distinct meanings. Um, so in the context of Malachi, the nation of Edom had, had so sinned that the effects would be felt forever. And that's what this passage is saying. The people with whom the Lord is angry forever, God's anger from Edom would not turn away. And so what exactly does that mean? Well, First off, what it meant is that the nation of Edom was destroyed and never became a nation again. And that's, that, that is a prophecy that did happen. Edom was destroyed and they never became a nation again. Um, but it's worth mentioning that the people of Edom could still seek him, but the nation wouldn't exist again. Um, it's, it, it's kind of hard to get across. You could say it like this. He's always mad. That's how we would see it. His anger would, would not cease. Versus the consequences will never go away. More of a concept. See the difference there? And so when we when we say um, when, when we say the, the Lord is angry for forever, that, that's more of an idea of what has been done is caused something to be set into motion that won't won't stop. A good way of that, another thing is you could say that the Lord's anger is forever into in all of humanity uh, from the sin in the Garden of Eden. 
Now, even though God has forgiven us, and, or made a way for us to be forgiven, I should say, um, the effects of the fall are obviously still all around us. So in that sense, God's anger is still going on. Hebrews 3, chapter 3, 11, and verse 11 says something very similar. It says, I declared in my, on oath in my anger, they shall never enter my rest. And this is where he's talking about Israel, how they were not allowed to enter, enter the promised land for 40 years. And Hebrews, Hebrews records that about it. He said, I promise they shall never enter my rest. That, that's like talking about a, a, permanent, um, a permanent consequence um, of, so, okay, they sinned. He got angry. The consequence came. The consequence was a permanent one. In, Jer in Matthew, it says, they will go away to eternal punishment, but the righteous to eternal life. That, once again, talks more of consequences. Not to say that God's anger is, is necessarily for forever. I will frown on you no longer, for I am faithful, declares the Lord. I will not be angry for forever. And here we see, again, a, a different situation. This is not talking about the nation of Edom. This is talking about the nation of, of, of Israel. A different situation where the consequences would not be for forever. Basically, um, you could say it like this. When, when we're talking about God's anger, we could say it like this. How long will I have to deal with this? Okay. When we are in a bad situation and it seems like, here's a great example. Somebody does something stupid in, in, their, in their teenage years, right? And it's something that stays with them throughout their life. And in their 30s or their 40s, they cry out to God and say, how long will I have to deal with this? How long before you turn from this? And it's like, well, it's the consequences of your actions. That, that is a good example of, of how the whole anger of God is, is being used in this context. So here in another spot in Jeremiah, it says, For in my anger a fire is kindled that shall burn forever. The NIV doesn't read like that. The NIV says, um, My anger has been kindled, and it will burn forever. And I don't think that that's very accurate. I think this is a more accurate translation. For in my anger in my anger a fire was kindled, and that fire shall burn forever. So because I got angry, there's a consequence that came, and that consequence will, will be reaching. So the anger wouldn't burn forever, but in his anger he chose to do something that would burn in their consciences forever. A good example of this is that the Bible talks about how Sodom and Gomorrah uh, would burn forever. But we know that they didn't burn forever. Sodom and Gomorrah, you know, the, the fires, they, they, didn't, they didn't stay there forever. They're, they're gone. Like, the fire currently is not burning. But yet it talks about it burning forever in the sense of the consequences and the mark on the conscience. Everybody knows the story of Sodom and Gomorrah. I mean, it's just... It's like a, the flood, even though they have been destroyed and gone for a long time. So then in uh, Numbers, it says, The Lord's anger burned against Israel, and he made them wander in the wilderness 40 years until the whole generation of those who had done evil in his sight was gone. So that, that's another good, another good example of that. And then in Psalm, this is from the NIV, it says, For his anger lasts only a moment. So after we consider all these things, we can say this. God's anger lasts only a moment. God isn't always angry. He experiences it. He experiences it, and the consequences sometimes stay for longer. But he himself is merciful. Um, to us, anger is more about emotion. But in ancient thought, it could include an emotion, an action. Even in anger, God is merciful. So what we could say in all this thing is: yes, God does get angry. The consequences of the anger sometimes extend, but he isn't angry for forever. I think that that's a good way to summarize all of it. So then we'll go back to this prophecy here in Jeremiah three. Return, you faithless children, this is the Lord's declaration. For I am your master, and I will take you, one from a city, two from a family, and I will bring you to Zion. So when he says one from a city, what he's talking about is that there will be a remnant that remains. They, they won't be lost and forsaken for forever. Um, I will give you shepherds who are loyal to me, and they will shepherd you with knowledge and skill. So right right there I want to point something out. And I'll, I'll read the next the next. Um, no, I'll stop there. I will give you shepherds who are loyal to me, and they will they will uh, shepherd you with knowledge and skill. People complain about false prophets and, and teachers. We have that going on right now. There's a lot of them out there. But here's the thing. Jeremiah tells us that if we turn away from our sin, God will bring us true leaders. Did you guys get that? It says, um, so return you faithless children, I will, and I will take you, and then I will give you shepherds who are loyal to me. After you've turned, after you've repented, I will raise up. I will raise up uh, true leaders for you. Um, so God promises that as we seek him, then he will bring the good, the good teachers by. What we try to do is we, we, we look at all the false teachers around us. We don't want to change. And then we want God to somehow bless us and, and give us, you know, all these, all these uh, teachers and, and every, make everything rosy when we haven't even, we haven't sought God. We haven't repented. We haven't turned from things. 
And then it says, when you multiply an increase in the land in those days, this is the Lord's declaration, no one will say again the Ark of the Lord's Covenant. It will never come to mind, and no one will remember or miss it. And uh, Another one will not be made. So the Ark of the Covenant was a chest that had the law in it. And on the very top, it had two angels uh, called cherubims. To the, the type of angel that it was was called a cherubim. And, um, and, uh, and that was on the top of the ark. And it was said um, from there that, 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 that God dwelt from, um, dwelt from there. Um, if you read in the Psalms, and it says God who is enthroned on the cherubim, it's talking about the way that his presence was said to dwell on the top of the ark. Um, it was kept in the innermost part. Of the uh, of the temple, the ark was kept in the innermost part, part of their, the Jew, the Jews temple, and it was symbolic of God's presence. And it was lost, and we don't know when it was lost. We don't even know what happened to it. We just know that they don't have it. And so then they went to exile, and it happened sometime in there, maybe before their exile, maybe during their exile, maybe after their exile. But either way, when they went back to the promised land from exile in Babylon, they didn't have it, and it was never in the temple again. They just didn't have it. So this is taught, given that given that Jeremiah is giving this prophecy, I'm guessing that it was already gone or lost or destroyed by the time that he's prophesying. At that time, Jerusalem will be called the Lord's throne. and all. So here, notice how the shift is changing. Even though the ark is gone, it's not even like it's a bad thing. You know, the ark is gone, and yet Jeremiah is acting like it's not that big of a deal. Uh, it will be called the Lord's throne, and all the nations will be gathered to, uh, to the name of the Lord in Jerusalem. So... Um, Rather than the ark as God's throne, Jerusalem would be. Now, Jerusalem is um, is a reference here uh, to the heavenly city. It, yes, it was a literal city, but it's also in this context, uh, he's talk, talking about the heavenly city that's coming. And uh, and all the, when it says all the nations, um, this is once again pointing forward to the way that um, the way was opened up for people of all nations to be saved through uh, through Jesus. So here we have Jeremiah talking about an immediate fulfillment and a, and a, and a, and a long-term fulfillment. So if, when you think of prophecy, think of different drops dropping in water. You know how when you drop like a stone in the water, it sends like that puddle out? Well, now imagine that you sent, dropped a puddle in and you dropped another stone in here and the two puddles kind of met with each other and they kind of overlap a little bit and they, they meet. That's kind of how prophecy works. Or if you imagine a, a mountain range and you've got the mountains here and then you've got like mountains behind them that, that are a little bit more harder to see and then like mountains behind them that are maybe a little bit it's like the, the depths of the mountains. That's kind of how prophecy works. So there'll be like more immediate things than like later fulfillments. And then sometimes it'll have multiple times when it's, when it's fulfilled. Um, like for instance, he's talking about the, the way that they have been, um, that they are going to come back from, from exile in the same way that we are going to come out of exile into heaven. So I mean, there, there's a lot of uh, uh, things like that in prophecy where it's kind of repeated in a lot of different ways. So uh, we will inherit the new heavens and the new earth the same way as, as he's talking here about, you know, all the nations will be gathered to it, uh, to the name of the Lord in Jerusalem, excuse me. And they will cease to follow the stubbornness of the evil hearts. In those days, the house of Judah will join with the house of Israel. They will come together from the land of the north to the land I have given your ancestors to inherit. So, yes, he's talking about the literal promised land, but more so than that, this has a greater fulfillment in uh, the coming kingdom when we will inherit the new heavens and the new earth. Uh, this is talking about the passing of the law. A time when the law will no longer be the dominating force, uh, and the coming of the new covenant it is also talking about Jesus coming and death in Jerusalem to lead his people from sin, and it's also talking about the way that we Christians are Israel. We have been grafted in, and uh, it is also talking about the exiles, exiles who would return without the ark um, at his time. So it, you, you have a lot of different fulfillments there. In those days, uh, the house of Judah will join with the house of Israel. So the Jew, all the all the Jews who believed in Christ and the Christians who believed in Christ, they're all gonna they're all gonna be God's people in heaven, um, and they will come together from the land of the north to the land I have given your ancestors to inherit the the new heavens and the new earth. So this is this is kind of a, a big deal for us, but in the immediate context, it's going to be fulfilled with um, some of the exiles from the scattered fault, scattered northern tribes meeting with the exiles of the southern tribes, and uh, there's going to be the reunion there which you can read about that in uh, Ezra and Nehemiah so uh, then it says uh, they will cease to follow the stubbornness of their heart God's people who aren't his people in name basically so instead of talking about the circumcision of the circumcision of the flesh like you know where you cut the pee pee uh, he's more talking about the circumcision of the heart um, his people who are his people in truth and then in verse 19 it says I thought how long to make you how, how I long to make you my sons and give you a desirable land. And with all these different times in these, in these verses, have you guys noticed the way 
that God continually says things like, I thought, I hoped, I, I believed that this would happen. Have you guys noticed that? It's been kind of a recurring theme. And uh, it, it's important to know, and I, and I could talk a lot more about this. I'm not going to, though. So let me just kind of clarify in, in, in real short and simple. God does foreknow. He knows what's going to happen. But and, and, and God experiences. And, and he, even though he knows what, what's going to happen, he still experiences that as it happens. Okay, But he gives the chance and the free will to choose. So when he says, I thought, it doesn't mean like he actually is convinced or he's lying to himself. Like, oh, maybe, I know it's going to happen, but maybe. It's more of a way of communicating that he was giving somebody a chance to do something. I thought, eh, yeah, I, I knew it wasn't going to happen, but I thought, you know what I mean? Kind of like that. So, uh, how I long to, ma uh, to make you my sons and give you a desirable land. Um, when he's talking about the desirable land, God literally looks for opportunities to do good. He, he literally just looks for any opportunity. We choose sin because it's fun and prevent blessings on ourselves. I mean, it's not like God is just waiting for us to mess up. No, he, he's, he's looking for opportunities to bless. A desirable land, the most beautiful inheritance of all the nations. I thought, you will call me my father and never turn away from me. However, as a woman may betray her lover, so you have betrayed me, house of Israel. Once again, talking about those terms of betrayal, and, and these are these are things that people experience. They know, they can understand this. He's not talking in some lofty language that people can't get. Um, God wasn't expecting perfection from them. And he's not expecting perfection from us. He's ex he was expecting obedience. The same thing as now. In fact, if you listen to all the prophecies, all the things he said in these prophecies to this point, pretty much the resounding thing that he said is don't worship other gods. I mean, that's like been the number one thing that he said over and over and over again. He's, he's not asking for the moon here. He's asking for obedience. And it wasn't even perfection. It was just really not that much stuff. It was impossible to follow all the law. We know that. But it wasn't impossible to trust in God, and it wasn't impossible to repent. They were just not even trying. They were seeking other gods and just being flippant about it. This is the Lord's declaration. A sound is heard on the barren heights, the children of Israel weeping and begging for mercy, for they have perverted their way. They have forgotten the Lord their God. Um, as they had worshipped the gods on the heights, now they are crying out to God on the heights. There's kind of this, this play that's going on here. They betrayed God by worshiping, by worshiping the idols on the heights and on every high hill. And now on the high hills, they're, they're crying out to God, what have we done? We've perverted our way. Return, you faithless children. I will heal your unfaithfulness here. We are coming to you, for you are the Lord our God. Surely falsehood comes from the hills, commotion from the mountains. But the salvation of Israel is only in the Lord our God. So when he talks about here from the hills and the mountains, this is referring to idol worship. Um, falsehood comes from the hills. Um, in fact, if I remember correctly, in Hebrew, I believe that the same word for lie is the same word as idol, if I remember correctly. And uh, so there's a lot of play on words going on here about the falsehood coming from the hills and, and the way that they went to the hills to worship the idols. Um, salvation is only from God. Some turn to witchcraft or mystical experiences or philosophies like atheism and experience things, that, but it doesn't, it doesn't satisfy them. It doesn't fulfill them. It doesn't save them. So the question is, and I, uh, I actually spent a lot of time thinking about this when I was writing this lesson, what is your mountain of commotion? Think about that. What is your mountain of commotion that is, that is, that is distracting you? I wrote some of, my, some of my answers. For me, pleasure, fun, escape, withdrawal, entertainment. Those are some of the things that are my mountain of commotion. And so think about that as you read this. Falsehood comes from the hills, commotion from the mountains. What is your mountain of commotion? From, time, from the time of our youth, the shameful one has consumed what our ancestors have worked for, their flocks and their herds, their, their sons and their daughters. And when it talks here, the shameful one, this is a reference to, uh, to the pagan god Baal. Uh, and the idea here is that they have nothing to show for their dedication to him. They, they, they've, they've betrayed Yahweh and they've been seeking him, but they have nothing to show for it. Uh, their attitude, uh, attitudes have worked against them their whole life. We can get bitter, prideful, stubborn, but it won't it won't satisfy. These things, these things won't satisfy. But luckily, like like also and God says here, return you faithless children, I will heal your unfaithfulness. There's that option of the open door. <clears throat> Two more sections, this one and the next one. Let us lie down in our shame. Let our disgrace cover us. We have sinned against the Lord our God, both we and our ancestors, from the time of our youth, even to this day. We have not obeyed the Lord our God. If you return Israel, this is the Lord's declaration, you will return to me. If you re remove your abhorrent idols from my presence, 
and do not waver, then you can swear as the Lord lives, in truth, justice, and righteousness, then the nations will be blessed by him and will boast in him. So there's a lot of different ways, excuse me, there's a lot of different ways that this, this um, can be translated. So we're going to have to take this, this one a little bit slower. Uh, first off, um, there's a little bit of a play here. Remember that they talked about the shameful one, Baal? And so now it says, let us lie down in our shame. So they worship the shameful one and are covered in shame. There's a kind of this, this play going on about, um, you know, the consequences of it and, and how that's the only thing that can come from it. Um, it would be the, it'd be the equivalent of if I said, um, we ran after the weary one and are weary. It's kind of like that same, uh, I don't know how to, what word I'm looking for. So the, there, there is a question here as to whether um, Israel was actually repenting, and if this is th their recorded repentance, where they say this, here we are coming to you for you are the Lord our God, this whole section here of like this repent of prayer that we've been reading. It's a question as to whether they actually said this, or was God just giving direction of how to repent? It's very unclear, and hard to know, because we don't have any historical reference of any of Israel repenting at this point. And returning so it's really hard to know and uh, we get to a place of wondering how we can get to God like oh how do I find God how do I get back how do I grow again how do I get back on, on good terms with God how do I grow as a Christian how can I Th the answer return you see God and you stop disobeying it's that simple we think that there's this big Canyon that separates us from God but there isn't what happens well I mean there is of sin the Canyon of sin but it's not something that we have to wade through for years it's, it's simply this you seek God today, and as you seek Him, He answers. Like um, I said it in a couple years ago in one of my sermons, and I'll say it again: God has a weak spot, and it's when we repent and seek Him with our whole heart. He just He He can't stay aloof. When we when we genuinely seek God, He just has this 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 overwhelming compassion that that takes us even in the midst of if we're being punished by Him or if something bad is happening, and uh, even if it's something that we deserve, God just has this this desire to, 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 to pour blessings on us and to love us. Um, <clears throat> so it's real simple. You seek God and you stop disobeying. It says here, um, if you remove your born idols from my presence and do not waver, the idea of waver is um, to, to do something without wavering means to stick with it. Uh, it doesn't mean necessarily to do it perfectly, but just to stick with it. Like, um, Gracie and I have been married without wavering. That's not to say that we haven't had fights or, or you know, whatever. But it's without wavering in the sense of it, it, it is still continuing on to today. So disobedience was keeping them from God. Obey to get back on God's page. Then once you're on God's page, so, so you're, you're off God's page, you're disobeying. You start obeying, you get back on his page, and then what happens after that? Then once you're on God's page, you keep obeying in greater and greater things, and he shows you more and more. See, when you first come to God, it's easy to see those things and to change, but then we kind of blind ourselves to the areas of change, to the real root problems, or we think, oh, I've grown enough, or whatever. Meanwhile, God's still trying to work in us. God's still trying to grow our character. So, obey in order. Uh, there's this kind of idea here that, of what's being said, and I'll try to say it in a way that, that is easier to understand. You obey in order to seek God, and as we seek God, we will learn to obey. It's kind of this circle which comes first which comes first obedience or seeking god yes <laughs> as you do one it leads to the other then it leads to the other um and it kind of this repetitive pattern um and the idea here if you return to israel this is the lord's declaration it can be if you're going to do it then do it um in fact some of the translations say if you return to israel then return if, if you are going to return to israel then return um this translation which is a csb says if you return to israel this is the lord's declaration you will return to me if you remove your born idols. So it's very similar meanings, and I'm not really going to get too into the differences, but it can be summarized like this. Um, you will return to me if you, remove, if you remove your born idols from my presence, you do not waver. Then you can swear, like the CSB says here, or, as the NIV says, if you swear truthfully, as the Lord lives, with truth and justice and righteousness, then the nations will be blessed. So I'll, I'll read them back to back again. The CSB says, Then you can swear as the Lord lives in truth and justice and righteousness, then the nations will be blessed by him and will boast in him. And the NIV reads, um, If you swear 
uh, truthfully as the Lord lives with justice and righteousness, then the nations will be blessed by him and will boast in him. And the idea is more or less the same. Our decisions make us and they also impact others. As we obey, we change, which affects others. This is kind of this this process of, so you guys need to change. You need to repent your sinning. Okay, we, we repent, we, we, we start obeying God. So then what happens is as as we come to God and truthfully, then he changes us and and then we and then we're able to swear swear truthfully as the bible says and then that will bless the nations so there's this process god fixes us so that we can bless others but oftentimes we want god to change everybody else and leave us alone and i think that's one of the root problems of why we don't seek growth in ourselves then so then this is the last section of this prophecy verse uh, five picks up another prophecy we're not going to look at that prophecy tonight um, it says for this is what the lord says to the men of judah and jerusalem break up the unplowed ground do not sow among the thorns circumcise yourselves to the lord remove the foreskin of your hearts men of judah and residents of jerusalem otherwise my wrath will break out like fire and burn with no one to extinguish it because of your evil deeds so um when he's talking about unplowed ground here and, and thorns uh, it can't we can't help but but realize that these are very similar things to what jesus said when he would come you know five six hundred years later um when he's talking about people with bitter hearts and when they're not listening to the gospel and those kinds of things. So the unplowed ground would be um, bitter hearts, immoral lifestyle, um, expecting blessings when you do the wrong thing, uh, spiritual deadness, um, anything that is preventing obedience to God, whatever it is. For some of it's, for, it's pleasure or, or so, a relationship. For some of us, it's uh, just stubbornness and, and not wanting to do something with our lives you know, and waste our lives on something that's not going to give us any pleasure. I don't want to do that. That sounds miserable. Um, really, it's for each of us. It's something else. Do not sow among the thorns. Uh, do not plant among the thorns. Is how you could say that. Um, you know, you need to you need to cultivate your heart. Basically, the idea here is seeking God with your whole heart. And then he goes to the idea of circumcision, which is again an, an idea of purity. Instead of instead of for, the score, foreskins of your penis, circumcise yourself to the Lord. Remove the foreskin of your heart. Um, and the idea here being dedicate yourself to God, be saved, be consecrated, repent, turn to God, uh, live for him. There's a bunch of different ways you could say that. Um, sin cannot produce anything but punishment and pain. And if you look here, otherwise my wrath will break out like fire and burn. What happened when they worshipped the shameful one? They became shamed. What happens if they if they don't turn to God and, and, and with, a, with, genuine, with genuine hearts and, and trust in him with their whole hearts? Well, he's gonna bring his wrath will break out like fire on them. Sin only produces punishment and pain, and never produces anything else. We think, oh, I want to live my life on my terms. I don't want to obey God in this because what'll it do for the kids? And then when because we don't obey God, the thing that we feared would come on our kids comes on our kids. You know what I mean? And um, well, there's that's pretty much. I think I kind of got got the point across here. So, any questions before we close this out? Okay, I've been talking about the different things that Jeremiah teaches us, um, you know, the way that it teaches us about God's patience and these different things. One thing that I was struck with these, with this path, with this prophecy was Jeremiah shows us that not everyone will be saved, but that doesn't mean that God doesn't care and doesn't love them. There's this idea uh, in in some cultic circles of Christianity um, that says that basically everybody's going to get saved, that there's no hell. Which basically, why even have Jesus come to earth to die? I mean, um, when, with that being said, Jeremiah shows us that no, not everyone will be saved. And, but that doesn't mean that God doesn't care and doesn't mean that God doesn't love them. So if you want to stay ahead of the curve and know what's going on next week, read Jeremiah chapter 4. And uh, we'll stop there.